So I was watching this Pinocchio video by Jacob Geller the other day, and it's a good look at the ever-evolving history of adaptations of a single puppet, although there is one version that was noticeably absent from the discussion. My favourite adaptation, Tree of Palm. It's strange and dark in a beautiful type of way. It wears its ugliness on its sleeve, a film about broken people. This might not look like Pinocchio in any shape or form, And yes, it takes liberties with the story, as we've seen many times before, yet it captures the bleak aspects of the original tale just so well. If the original Disney Pinocchio was released at the beginning of the golden age of cell animation, Palm's release marks its end. One of the last cell animated movies made in Japan, an almost perfect marriage between traditional and digital technology, created by a studio that no longer exists. A film so visceral, I wonder how it was made for children, or how it got greenlit in the first place. So unfortunately, because of draconian copyright bots, I won't be able to monetize this video, especially not before the release date. Luckily, this video was sponsored by Squarespace, so help remedy that. That is a website platform for those in the know. If you're old or new, they can help you make a website that looks good. So I made a website for my art and animation. They have a whole selection of gallery features here, which you can customize to your heart's content. It all looks very nice and professional. And as well, you can basically customize your website to be whatever you want because of its flexible templates to begin with. Also, when it came to my animations, I've created a video section, which can both link to things like Vimeo and YouTube, but you can also just directly upload your animation at high quality onto the website with about 30 minutes of space on the website you can do whatever you want with. So head to squarespace.com to get your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, you can get 10% off by using my code at www.squarespace.com slash Stephen. Thank you very much, Squarespace. Now let's get back to why Palm came to be. Well, that all starts with one legendary animator, Takashi Nakamura, the director and creator of Tree of Palm. In the 80s anime scene, he was one of the most important up-and-comers, capturing a weight and finesse that made him stand out next to his peers for a mastery of animation timing. There's a naturalness in the way he uses space and pauses. Nakamura gained the attention of Hayao Miyazaki, who recruited him onto Nausicaa. He'd do fantastic cuts in this brutal production. It was a production that started to change his philosophy when it came to animation, as Nakamura took on larger roles, such as animation director for a group of realist animators on projects like Akira. Well, you can see some of his taste, a preference towards full animation, catching the nuance of movement, even down to things like featuring lip sync. I never thought of becoming a director. I always preferred to be an animator crafting movement. And yet he still had stories he wanted to tell. For Robot Carnival, Nakamura received his first opportunity to direct a short movie. Unlike the work he'd created with Otomo, Nakamura's pictures were family friendly. Storyboard settings, many different pieces of mechanical devices, next to exaggerated character expressions. No need for dialogue to express the premise. It's all a highlight the flashy moves. And Nakamura's interest in Disney's illusion of life. Something that is expanded in Catnapped, his first feature movie with Triangle Staff. A legendary studio, most well known for their work on Serial Experiments Lane, but Catnapped was not like a that anime. It kept its preference towards his lighter work. Full of creative locations, set pieces, all presented with lavish animation, thanks to its small but dedicated team. Made possible by Taro Maki, an independent producer who invested in unconventional anime. He had an ambition to go all the way on projects he really believed in, and Maki took a liking to Nakamura, so he offered him up a dream project for their next outing. One that wouldn't be as simple as Catnap's short runtime. It's going to be a big project. We're talking 85,000 drawings and a two hour and 15 minute runtime, an original premise. And it sort of breaks that nomenclature that an anime movie should stay under two hours long. That's going to be a lot, especially when you consider during its seven years of production, Triangle Staff liquidated and split all its resources between two separate studios. Today, we're going to be talking about Palm Studio, which was created specifically to finish this movie. By that point, Maki had recruited a giant production committee of lots of different companies to help finish this project because we have 500 people on the staff, which is about as big as any other Studio Ghibli movie. And yes, Nakamura would be taking a leading role, but without his animators, there is no movie. 
first up are going to be the Akira staff, with a good handful of them returning to work with Nakamura again, because they share that kind of philosophy. Notably, Toshiyuki Inoue, who became the character designer, adapting Nakamura's art to the screen. He also created a handful of really great cuts in the movie, including this standout sequence. Referring back to classic epics like Die New Belugen. In a way, nowadays works with Production IG, who gives support on the film, with in-betweens alongside other giant studios like Studio Ghibli, with a few of their veterans also joining the key animations, say for example Otani. We even get an ex-member of Topcraft who Nakamura worked alongside during Nausicaa, Yoshida. But there's no end to the talent picked up in this project, and while only a few cuts have actual credits for them, the amount of impressive work on display is pretty self-evident throughout even down to the fully realized locations, such as Flamingo Town, with its bustling underbelly. A variety of settings is a credit to the art direction, and it captures the original boards very well. It's a unique look, which I'll credit to, in some part, the director of photography, who also worked on Lane. They brought together the distinct elements, you know, we're bouncing between dark pits with sort of beautiful backlit animation and vacant deserts. Like every other Japanese artist of a generation, Mobius's impact looms large here, specifically over its backgrounds, reminiscent of his collaborative project Time Surgeon, a movie which has a cult following in Japan. Nakamura has discussed other French influences on his work. Palm seems to have a similar sense of pillow shot as Lelou's other movies. It helps you take in the surreal nature of it only accentuated alongside its French music. It oozes in such a way to spellbind, using an instrument known as an onstma tunau to capture its soundscape. It's a sort of early French electronic instrument, not unlike a Furman, but with far more control, almost sounds like a voice at times, can be exhibiting shrieks of terror or tranquility, only lending to the otherworldly direction of it all since the movie lets itself breathe, but also kind of can crush you in its a cacophony of different instrumentations, firing you all at once, creating a sort of tension that is never really captured in the Disney Pinocchio movie. What I wanted to do with this was to take the original idea of the little wooden puppet who wants to be a boy and change the viewpoint on it and look at it more deeply. That's how I developed the story. While the movie was advertised as a family film, it might actually not be the best way to sell its appeal. It's easy to miss the other aspects of its narrative. Often I've seen Palm's story derided as one of its weaker aspects. Perhaps if you're expecting a straightforward adventure movie for kids, the ever-expanding lore, larger cast of characters, as well as its sort of dour elements might be a little too much to cram in one movie that's already way past the regular runtime. Some of that might be the side effects of the film changing its format several times throughout its production from manga to TV anime to movie. On the surface, it seems like a mashup of well-known things at the time, maybe Nausicaa, Akira, Thunderdome. But under that surface, its strength is building a narrative of what it means to be human, even if it is more on a dream level. For some, Palm isn't a relatable character. He's a protagonist that starts with a dead stare that leaves the audience cold. For the first act, he isn't really there. He's still looking for a reason to continue after his mother's death, until his point of self-actualization. Bonds are something that really define people's lives. The Tree of Palm is a story of the damaged and traumatized, either abused or with no one left. After all, the main characters are a group of orphans. When Palm joins them, originally the leader wanted to sell him off because he isn't like them, he's not human, which is the crux of Palm's journey. Over time, his goal becomes almost like a single-minded obsession that washes any of the sweet innocence away from him. In his heart, he may be a good-natured and caring person, but it might be hard for some people to see, who aren't, say for example, Popo. Their relationship gives meaning to Palm. Popo is a character who is trapped between a world of adults and children. She's forced to live with an abusive mother. Her father is long past. By day, she's treated as an object of desire by disgusted men, and her mother resents her for it, which causes a strange sense of shame. She's developed some sort of fear response, which you can see in how she reacts to Palm the first time, though he's not exactly doing himself any favors. Though after they fix their mus communication here, Palm and Popo are able to start forging a bond from a joint sense of loss. With Popo showing Palm things she's never shown anyone before, they both can kind of express themselves fully. 
it's a sweet, subtle way of building their relationship, one which also highlights the otherness Palm feels for not being human. In the original Disney movie, the real boy thing didn't really seem to factor much into Pinocchio's uh, day-to-day, but here you can really feel that hollowness. That sense of otherness brings the two children together as kindred spirits. It's all going well, right? It's a wholesome time. After all that nastiness, especially when Popo leaves with Palm. It's cute. To Palm, this is like a replacement for his mother, which sounds a bit Freudian when you think about it, though I don't know if Freud ever expected a, a puppet to sort of fall in love with a girl who looks exactly like his mother. Maybe that truly means that uh, <laughs> Palm is human. If it's even that type of relationship, the story leaves it up to the audience. So, you've made it halfway through the video. Congratulations. We're going to take a slight break just to thank my patrons, because this video being demonetized means it's likely blacklisted, so they're the people that actually give the channel its lifeblood. So let's have a look at the tome. That includes Lenny, Tim James Richards, Stravagen, Stratos, Chunks, J, Foxmolder, OT, Paul, Steen's Mum, Subsofa, Systematic, Karen, Nick, Doji, Peter, Jaeger, Vic Boss, DTB, Gambaroni, Julius, and... Is it pronounced Alf? Uh, you have to tell me sorry about that. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for your continued support and everyone else. They're really the thing that keeps this channel going. By the way, the rest of this video is going to have spoilers, so take that into account as we continue on to the second half. I'd argue Palm and Popo's relationship is very reflective with the themes of the movie, where there are definitely heartwarming elements, but it falls back into some old toxic patterns. You know, Popo's fear about patriarchal relationships, where people could take ownership of her, but then Palm suddenly becomes very protective and possessive, and that only gets worse as he starts deteriorating. Many red flags appear, yet Popo seems pretty dedicated to him, no matter what he does. Maybe that's because she's never known any other type of relationship. And Palm is very impressionistic, and also absent of healthy relationships in his life, leaving him deeply insecure about things he can't be, a strong man. He admires the leader of the group, Shatter. He tries to mirror him, repeats things he says, even goes into role-playing, if he takes it way too far sometimes. Killing the innocent creature here, on one side, he barely understands the concept of death. You know, when he says he's going to be together with Popo forever, you might actually believe it. And in this moment, he sees death firsthand and the fragility of life. Not all things have a shell as hard as his. He's got blood-soaked hands and he's shaking, lying through his teeth like a child, though his innocence dies that day. A crushing guilt only leads him further down a dark path. It's reminiscent of a scene in the original book where Pinocchio accidentally kills a talking cricket by throwing a book at it, and yes, it's the one you're exactly thinking of. This interpretation does let Palm be uglier than he is in other versions. Even himself understands, like he registers something is deeply wrong with him, you know, he's kind of pleading for some solution, because it doesn't feel like he deserves to be with Popo, even though he's sort of overwhelmed by this desire, but it starts to cloud his judgement, which is generally a repeating pattern throughout the movie. I can kind of relate to the visceral journey Palm's going through, because a couple of years back before I saw this movie, I was diagnosed with ADHD, you know, spectrum condition, and there's a lot of relation there to sort of feeling like you don't belong or feeling weird or uncomfortable and trying to conform and having something wrong with you that you don't know about that you you don't really know what to do about and also being in a position where it, it kind of leaves you feeling very blue for a time and I was in a pretty low period before I got diagnosed and it took a long time to get that medication and diagnosis and during that period you know the only thing keeping me going was just that one goal of being like I need to I need to do this to just sort of be able to live my life. Even if you want to be able to do things uh, the way other people do, it just, you can't. And I can see that feeling in Palm. Moreover, you can kind of see that Palm doesn't read cues well, he doesn't really know what to say all the time, which also relates to a sort of spectrum conditions. So I can see some of myself in him. When Palm is overstimulated and low, it basically becomes visually all-consuming. The landscape, him, it sort of pulls him down and traps him even when he wants to push past it. And, you know, autism, ADHD, those conditions don't necessarily lead to the healthiest coping mechanisms, especially if you don't know what you're going through, or if you're in a dark place. So I can kind of see how that can happen with Palm, because ultimately there is no fix-all solution to these things. If anything, this is sort of a bleak reflection of the full spectrum of what it means to be a human. And it sort of builds Palm into the person that he is over a robot. But pushing down all that emotional guilt and trauma, it's not going to stay down forever, it's going to start spilling out eventually. Palmer's flawed, right? It's another factor in which makes him sympathetic, because he's ultimately influenced by the ghost inside him, Karam, who was a surrogate to the Blue Fairy, 
both gives life and takes it away in this situation, her inner turmoil changes palm and feeds into his insecurity, like a, a vengeful ghost. Although when we see snapshots of her life, it sort of reflects the same damages as the rest of the cast. She has an abusive father who never acknowledges her, and that folds into palm and he starts sort of repeating those patriarchal relations. It's almost like a continuous cycle of abuse. Maybe why it's so effective is Palm and Karam's relationships, they kind of mirror each other, both with obsessions to parental figures long gone. It seems to be a story about fragile hearts and their desire to be understood, which is why Pogo is so important, because she is able to break that chain despite the terrible things she's experienced. She never treats anyone with spite. She has an empathy to her. That compassion is the thing that brings Palm back, and he is then able to bring it forward to Karam and resolve the inner conflicts he has. I would have liked to see more of Popo's perspective, really, and her character. In fact, there was a whole book written from her perspective from Japan in the sort of media tie and landscape, though it never made it into English. There are some things that aren't made very clear, and that's probably intentionally so, you know, why did she let Palm complete his quest when it could have doomed them all? But I guess that's sort of the debate that the movie sort of perpetuates forever, if it's empathy or if it's devotion. A lot of this is going to be up to the interpretation, and you kind of will play that game. Palm adapted the original intended ending for the Pinocchio story where he actually, spoilers, dies. I wouldn't say it's completely dour. I mean, there's definitely a moment of serenity in it all, accepting your own mortality and spending it with the ones you love. It's one of the most human things you could do. Although I still get emotional at the end every time. I think then it talks about the nature of life. If you're stuck in a dark place or in these cycles of abuse, there is power and empathy and caring for others. That what makes us who we are seems to be more the bonds we make and supporting those, even if they seem strong, few people really truly are. And sure, maybe there's like too many action scenes in the movie and that's really only there to kind of keep it moving, especially towards the end. I feel like the inner conflict is more important than the explosions. It's a bit overstuffed. Standing between an adventure film and art house, Yet, I would say it is a film that will haunt my dreams and has ever since I've watched it. One day I'd love to be able to talk to the people on the staff and ask them, like, what was the deal with it? How did the production go? Because it kind of feels in some ways that there might have been some struggle here towards the end, just to get out the door. And yeah, there are a lot of other analysis on this. I've only really scratched the surface. You can find plenty of stuff because Palm is on where there's a lot to unpack. It's like the opposite side of the Nausicaa movie. That was also a gamble. If it failed, it could have squashed Miyazaki's entire future in directing. Palm also was sold on that same kind of premise of a, say, prolific talent with an impressive credentials is making this original movie. If Palm had been a massive success, maybe Nakamura would still be making these type of things at Studio Palm to this day. So is this a movie that broke at Studio? I very much doubt it. Studio Palm didn't sort of collapse until about five years after this movie, and realistically a studio like this was never meant to last too long in this industry. If Palm was a success or not. And we don't really know because, well, we don't have things like the TV deals, we don't know the physical release copies, sales, we don't know about merchandise or even its deal with Dark Horse, we really don't know exactly how this film did in the end. Unless you have a massive hit or are really lucky, it is hard to get your project proposal to pass. Nakamura has never returned to big Japanese animation as the main director. He has done some co-direction on things which were pushed to him through Studio 4C, but he's out of the spotlight now. Most of the stuff he's done in later years is personal projects reserved to shorts, which have a charm and energy to themselves. Even when returning to these wordless plays, you can see how he's matured as a storyteller. I'd love to see more of his passion projects, but I'd settle for just most of his work having modern releases. You know, his latest short, Yulain and Cassilia, I have no idea how to pronounce it, it's got a funny name. That one has never been publicly shown outside of like film fairs. And Palm has not had a release since DVD. I do actually have the Region 2 DVD, but it has like very bad like uh, frame rate uh, problems with ghosting because it's, it's the wrong frame rate because of you know different regions for some reason still even though it came out in 2007 but i digress you can buy a hd rip like a digital release of it um, on amazon prime from japan if you live in the right place but i don't know if it's a true master the trailer they show it kind of looks like it has some banding issues I, I have no idea if it's better than the dvd or not the rights in the west might be in some kind of fugue state like with angel's egg and if despite that angel's egg could become a bit of a indie hit in the West as well. I don't see why Palm can't too. I'll catch you next time.